Uh, well, first I would like to thank Professor Berry for inviting me here. It's been a real pleasure to come here. And uh, what I wanted to talk today about is about modeling and simulation from languages to, uh, from physics to languages and software. Oh. Uh, there are many views on modeling. You know, physicists, uh, essentially all engineering education deals with modeling. And physicists use modeling a lot, you know, mass, energy, and momentum balances. Uh, it's very important in mathematics. We are engineers use modeling a lot. There's a lot in, done in computer science where language and computer structures come in. And um, uh, modeling is also very important. This is a document that's produced by the US National Academy of Engineering. And you see what they say there, that um, creation of new engineering structures Computer-based design build engineering will become the norm for most products, accelerating the creation of complex structures. So simulation modeling plays a very important role in this. So what I will do in this lecture, I will present a couple, two modeling paradigms. One is block diagram models, and you already have seen uh, quite a few block diagrams in the previous lecture. And then I will talk about equation-based modeling and then I will move on to talk about a modeling language called Modelica. And then I will do a little bit of summary. One thing we have to do when we work with technical systems to deal with complexity. And um, we have many different physical domains. You have mechanical system, you have electrical system, you have thermodynamics, you have heat conduction. Many systems have large physical dimensions. There's a large number of components. They have complex behavior. And particularly today, when we try to make systems more and more efficient, you try to not waste energy by re recycling a lot. And in production system, you try to do just-in-time production uh, to uh, avoid having storages. A very nice example uh, of um, uh, modeling is the Toyota Prius, which I will talk a little bit about later, where they were doing a totally new structure of a car by having electric motors and a, a, a regular combustion engine. And then to combine this into a sensible system. And they cut down significantly on number of experiments by using um, uh, simulation. Uh, another difficulty we're faced with that you have to deal with both continuous and discrete time that you already heard in Professor Berry's lecture. So to deal with complexity, we do abstractions. And one abstraction that is very popular in control is the block diagram. This is taken from a German book in control from, from um, 1954, more than 150 uh, years ago. So what you do when you have a complex system in here, you cover the pieces here by cloth, and then you only look to the input-output behavior. And in control, the blocks are described by ordinary differential equations, and they are causal models. So the input here is generating the output. It's a very useful abstraction. And it's also a key for one simulation tool I will talk about here, namely analog computing. Uh, it's also essential for control. And I would say that control engineers are, brain, are brainwashed by block diagrams because they only think in this, in this paradigm. And that can be very dangerous. And I will explain to you that this is not a good view if you are going to do serious physical modeling. Because it's not the way that captures physics now. And the reason is that with physical system, there are actually often connection back from this system to this one, which is not captured by the, the causal model. Um, simulation uh, is a way to visualize behavior of a model. And Vannevar Bush said this already in 1927. He was working on large electrical networks, which is a complicated system. And he said that uh, engineering cannot progress any faster than mathematical analysis, which we have. And formal mathematical methods was inadequate for numerous problems. For example, the electrical systems he was considering. So he proposed a mechanical solution. And what he did is he built a mechanical differential analyzer. A mechanical piece of equipment that you program with uh, wrenches, and it could solve about six differential equations had a large impact because uh, differential analysis of this spread quite a bit over the world. And of course, they changed a lot when you got digital computers. 
So analog computing, uh, the way it works is that you solve an ordinary differential equation by using a feedback loop. So what you have to do, you have to create something that can integrate. And then you have to create something that could generate a function. So in this integrator, you, you, in this function in here, you send in the inputs you have, and you send input the states, and this function delivers a rate of change of states. And then when you integrate this, you get back the state, and then you close this feedback loop. So that's one reason why control, which deal with feedback loops, and analog computing have always been very tightly connected. Now what you have to do is that you have to do a device that integrates. What Vannevar Bush did, they had the a mechanical ball and disk integrators that was used much earlier by Lord Thompson for a tidal simulator. Uh, a nice thing, so what you have to do integration and function generation. Uh, all computation are done in parallel, which is very nice. And I've illustrated here by a diagram. So here you have an integrator. Here you have a summer that's summing these signals. Here you have a, co a coefficient that's changing parameters. Typically in electrical things, this would be a potentiometer. So in here you get a diagram like this. And everything works in parallel, so it goes very fast. On the other hand, you are limited by the amount of hardware that you have. Because if you wanted to simulate a larger differential equation, you need to add more hardware. There is one very important concept here called the algebraic loops. If you trace around the loops in here, and if you find a loop where you don't have an integrator, that's called an algebraic loop. How this showed up in electronic differential analyzer was that you start, the system started to oscillate and you get strange sounds. And what people did at that time, they put in a little, little capacitor in the loop and then they got rid of the oscillations. Uh, of course, you cannot do this when you move into the digital world because putting in a little capacitor means that you get a very stiff differential equation and integration is going to go very slow. So algebraic loop was an important aspect of this. Uh, then you had another thing which was interesting. In analog simulation, uh, you, uh, you had to deal with, uh, when you move from mechanical to electrical, you have to deal with voltages, typically plus minus 100 volts. You scaled all variables to plus minus 100 volts. And then you added a little alarm. So if any signal went above plus or minus 100 volts, you get an alarm indicating there was something wrong with your simulation. I will come back to this later in here. Another thing that was very difficult to do in this world was granularity and uh, aggregation. The granularity was simply things that could um, integrate, things that could sum, and function generators. I gave you an example here. This is an electrical motor drive. So you have a motor sitting here, you have a gearbox, you have an inertia, and then you have a PI controller. And then if you look to the, the drive system in here, you know, you have an induct inductance in the motor, you have also a little resistance, and you have a back EMF that's sitting here, and is the voltage coming into it. So this was how you would draw the diagram. If you do an analog computer diagram, you do a physical model, so you write the equations of motion of the load, you write the equation of load of the motor, uh, you have a model for the gearbox, which influences both the velocities and the torques, and then you write the equation for the electric motor, and then you write the equations for the controller. So in here you got seven equations. Now to use an analog computer, you have to derive a state equation. So you have to manipulate these equations until you get out the state of the system, which happens to be three variables. Uh, the angular velocity of the load, the um, integration that you have of the, uh, the controller, the, or the current, and then you have a state that is the integral of the error. So you have three states. Uh, and it's quite a bit of work to go manually from these equations. Also you see in here that some coefficients here, uh, this is something that has to do with the gearbox. This is something that has to do with inertia of the load. This is something that has to do with inertia of the motor. And this is a coefficient of uh, the controller. So the physical parameters of the different components, they get aggregated in here. And you can visualize the difficulty now when you have a very large physical system and you have to make this transformation here manually. So it's a substantial amount of work. Uh, this is what an analog computer might look like. It's an electronic analog computer vintage around 1950. So you program it by, by patching wires into a box in here. 
you are adjusting coefficients by, by adjusting these coefficients. Uh, and then you get plots out in terms of print signal. Uh, so there were typically simulation centers at many research institutes, at the large aerospace companies and other large companies. And they were run by groups who were maintaining this equipment. So simulation was available only to a fairly limited number of people. Um, one nice thing, you can manipulate parameters directly by changing to see what's happening. There was also another thing, namely hardware in the loop simulation. This is a picture I got from the Saab airplane company. So they've designed a control system for an aircraft. So they have a control system here in terms of um, an analog uh, representation that's programmed in the analog computer. In here, they are using regular motors for, uh, and hydraulics, and then they are simulating the uh, aerodynamics. So in this way, they could simulate the control system for the aeroplane before the whole thing was made. And that's called hardware in the loop simulation, or HIL. Today, a hardware in the loop simulation may look like this. This is taken from an automotive company where they are testing this box. So you just have regular computers and regular hardware with an electronic interface. So of course, this is my, has changed dramatically from the analog computer era. I also wanted to put up this one. Uh, there was a group at the um, Servo Mechanism Laboratory at MIT who was going to build a flight simulator. And they decided to move from analog technique to digital technique. And so they made, uh, and they developed the world wind computer that you might have heard of. It was done by Forrester. And in connection with this, they also discovered the core memory. Many people who were working there later moved on to digital equipment. So all the digital equipment, they have actually their, their origin in the, this simulator that was built at MIT. When digital computers came around, it became popular to emulate analog computers with uh, analog computing with digital computers. And there were many attempts that were made on this. Uh, they did it uh, at the Air Force labs, IBM did this, and there was a collection of, is this better? Yeah. There was a large collection of um, emulators. By 1965, about thir uh, uh, 30 of them. Then a big effort was made by something called the Simulation Council to unify this and come up with a um, unified simulation language that was CSSL. This was implemented by a company called ACSL, which for a long time became the sort of standard way of emulating analog computers. I will mention a few more in here. I will mention one that we were involved with in Lund because it involved continuous and discrete time. It was done by a very talented student, Elmquist. I will also mention MATLAB and Simulink, which in a certain sense is the, the ultimate block diagram network. So let's move on to, uh, uh, this is what the digital emu emulators look like. Uh, here is a program. Uh, you, say, you say you have a derivative that you calculate and you have something called x dot, which says that the derivative of x is equal to f. Um, and then it was written in Fortran and then you had, uh, it was declarative. So you didn't have to write these things in the right order. So you were sorting the equations in the right order. Uh, and then you were detecting algebraic loops. Uh, it was a preprocessor in Fortran, so you run this through Fortran and then you run a Fortran compiler. There were a couple of built-in Fortrans. And also there were explicit integration algorithms and they were often interleaved with the pro programs themselves. Uh, whenever you wanted to change parameters, you had to do recompilation. Um, I came to uh, the university after spending time with the military doing guidance systems and after spending five years at IBM working on computerized process control. So I came to university in 1965, started a new department. Uh, it was a new engineering school that started in 61. We had an old university nearby. Right now we are integrated with the university. So LTH is the engineering school of Lund University. I started a research program in control and we had a number of um, uh, theoretical themes optimization, computer control, system identification, adaptive control. And then I decided that I should at all times have what I call an honest application in the group. And what I mean by an honest application, I mean something we do with industry. It has deadlines and it has hard deliveries. Because then you get a very interesting tension between people who are trying to de deliver something and then people who are trying to deliver theory. And we also switched the 
applications over the years. One thing we discovered was that it was highly desirable to develop computational tools to solve control problems, to be able to deliver results to industry quickly. So we developed a suite of interactive programs, all written in Fortran. It was SIMPAC for control system design, IDPAC for system identification, MODPAC for transformation models. And they were quite widely distributed in industry and university. Um, a reprogramming of this in MATLAB is now the system identification toolbox, for example. Um, we needed a nonlinear simulator. And when I worked for IBM, I was very near to the group who developed the, the IBM emulator. So I knew it wasn't a fantastically difficult to run an emulator. And I got a very talented student, Hilding Elmquist. He never wrote a master thesis on a simulator. The simulator had two types of system, continuous type systems, discrete type systems, and connecting systems. And um, uh, so I wanted to have a, a simulator that could simulate a controller with a computer control. The way we did time was that we introduced something called sampling time, TS. And TS is the next time this module is going to get into action, and then we had a very simple way of, uh, of, of updating this. We could also you know, investigate sampling jitter and things like this. Uh, this program was later rewritten and distributed in, in quite a large number of copies out to industry. And I have to talk about MATLAB, uh, because we essentially stopped all these research programs around 1980. And MATLAB, of course, was a contributing factor to this. MATLAB started by Klee Moller, because he had been doing languages, he had been doing software for linear algebra, and he wanted to test them. So he did a program called um, uh, an interactive matrix laboratory. And we got hold of this in 1980. Um, and um, then, of course, it was, re it was revised later. Well, control engineers discovered Klee Moller's program, and they found that it was very useful to con for control. So they started to develop control design languages in, in MATLAB. And one of the first was a company called Systems Control in Palo Alto. Uh, and the people who were working with this, they jumped the company and started their own company that's called Integrated Systems, uh, when it was about half ready. John Little, uh, and they also did something called Matrix X. They did System Build, which was a simulator. They did the code generation. John Little was also working for this company. And they got the permission to do a PC MATLAB. And they started MathWorks. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the mat, uh, uh, MathWorks took over a lot of the, uh, the market for this. And they did PC MATLAB, and they did Simulink that you heard a little bit about. There was also activities of this in France. At INRIA, you did BLAS about the same time as uh, MATLAB came out. You also did Scilab, and there's a, a version called Octave that's running. There's a very nice interactive version of MATLAB that's done by a small Swiss company called Calariga. And then, of course, we have uh, Comsol's FEMLAB, which is about the same family. So MATLAB Simulink is quite a nice simulation environment, but um, uh, there are several drawbacks when you are uh, doing uh, connecting systems. For example, MATLAB is based on states. So all the boxes in MATLAB are state models. Now, if you make a model for, for two capacitors, here's one capacitor, here's another one, and you would like to connect them. What you get in physics, you get a spark, and then the voltage across them are the same. This is something you cannot handle in the block diagram framework. Uh, the same thing if you have two wheels spinning, you have the equation of one wheel and another wheel, and then you connect them. Then you get some friction, and they start to run with the same velocity. Now, angles are the same, velocity are the same. You can't, you can't do this in block diagram languages. Also, another thing, that composition doesn't work. If this is a tank that you represent by a block, and now you connect two tanks after each other, well, in here, the pressure of, uh, of that, the level of that tank will influence the pressure here, and it will influence the outflow of this. So this doesn't work. So composition doesn't work, and also you cannot connect systems. There is also another thing, which is more mundane, namely that there is a lot of labor to go from, uh, uh, from the basic physical equations down to, uh, to state equations. So lesson number one, block diagrams are not suitable for serious physical modeling. Lesson number two, 
uh, when you moved from um, analog computing, where you simply had to have integrators when you move into the digital world, maybe the right thing was not just to translate the analog paradigm, maybe it's much better to sit back and think what you really should do when you are changing technology. So I think there are two important lessons here that we can learn. So that brings us to uh, equation-based modeling. And the way we came into this was that we had a project with industry to do boiler control, a fairly complicated sis physical system with a lot of different physics involved with this. And um, we did a fun thing. We persuaded the company to remove most of the controllers and then we're changing all things around the process for quite a long time. And we, start, we got very useful data to figure out how the process was behaving. So that was part of a system identification exercise. Um, there was also a lot of work done by students to simulate the system. For example, one large Simnon model was written and it was really painful you know, to go through all the transformations. So um, we looked at a lot of different things of of doing physical modeling. One thing of course that was natural to was electronics. Where if you describe electronics, you have multi-port systems, which is covering some of the connections. It's also component-based. You have resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Uh, and what you would like to do is would, you would like to have components and connect them. And there was a nice program written in 1973 that was uh, about the same time we were working. So we looked at SPICE, which was quite a nice program to simulate electrical circuits. But it was not easy to bring mechanics and fluid mechanics into SPICE. And uh, they made a lot of use of uh, Kirchhoff's laws and the node equations. There were also nonlinear equations, and they were using tearing, which I will talk about, to solve the equations. Differential algebraic equation, they also uh, came across uh, found that differential algebraic equations were very convenient and also Will, Bill, William Gear developed codes to develop that. Well, along this chain, uh, SPICE became a very important part of the tool chain for VLSI design. It's actually one of the IEEE milestones. And we also looked at bond graphs. That was invented by Henry Painter at MIT to model physical systems. And um, it's a graphical uh, representation, and it can handle bidirectional exchange of in, in energy. And it's using what you call across and through variables, which are generalization of voltages and currents. And bond graphs are beautiful if you only have one essential balance equation, for example, an energy, if you can capture most of the things with an energy balance. What we had, we had to deal with energy balance, momentum balance, mass balance, and energy balance. And we tried to do bond graphs in here, and we could not do it. And later on, I checked our models with, uh, with painter students, and none of them have been able to take our boiler model and represent it with a sensible bond graph. So we gave up on bond graphs. Uh, what we did is that I had this smart student, Elmquist, and we're sitting there and discussing that he wanted to do a PhD. And there were lots of requests on extensions of Simnon to add you know, vectors, to add matrices, to add hierarchical system description. And, um, but we also said that Maybe it was much more interesting to, to start to look at what should you do if you would like to describe, um, uh, if you'd like to really model physical systems. So we we'll looked to the ratio between inspiration and transpiration. This was a much better PhD program. So Elmquist, uh, he, we looked at this and they said, we should really try to do a modeling language that's suitable for control. And in control, we have to deal with a lot of different physical domains. And he ended up writing a coming up with a language called Daimola. It was equ equation-based. Uh, here is the dissertation, and here's the web page where you can download the dissertation. And at that time, the only object-oriented framework was Simula, you know, that was uh, coming out of Norway. And there was quite a bit of expertise in the computer science department in London about Simula. Uh, and also to do this, uh, there was extensive symbolic computing. And then I told him, I won't pass your dissertation unless you can run the boiler model. You know, that's the advantage of having honest applications around. You get a real application, you get a real case study to use it. Uh, we found out, uh, he, he made his thesis in 1978, and it was a great idea, but it was really premature because computation capacity, you know, memories were not large enough, address and spaces was not large enough, and we needed to a lot of symbolic manipulation, 
and also software was not around. You know, industry would certainly not use Simula at the time. We wanted to have something we could put out to industry. So we gave up. Uh, we, we stopped this activity. We also st stopped the activity, other activities around 1980. So uh, what is behind the, this sort of simulating is that you work at wide physical domains. What you do is you divide the system into subsystems. You define interfaces. You use object orientation for structuring. You use mass momentum and energy balances for subsystems. You model a subsystem by differential algebraic equation, not ordinary differential equations. And this also has to do with modeling of interfaces. And then you use constitutive equation and database for material properties. You use libraries for reuse. And you do a lot of symbolic, uh, symbolic manipulation to generate code for simulation and other purposes. Um, something that happens, you know, if you take this mechanical system, you cut it up into pieces, you get these pieces in here. And then you have a lot of variables. You find that this force is equal to that force. That force is equal to that force. So there's a lot of trivial equations. So you have to eliminate all the trivial equations. And then we do reduction of what's called block, triang block lower triangular form, which I will tell you more a little bit about. And in this block, you may have linear equation that you can solve analytically. And then you solve the nonlinear equation by Newton method and by using something that's called tearing. And then you get a differential algebraic equation with a low index that you integrate. And all of that was involved in Daimola, although in a fairly simple fashion. But all the elements were there. So let me now talk about uh, reduction to BLT. Uh, you, you, you make a matrix or a graph where you list all the variables in here. And then you, you list all the equations where the variable occurs. And you make a mark. This variable comes up in this equation. In this equation in here, we have, uh, the, we have these two variables. And uh, there's a very nice graph algorithm by Tarian that takes all these equations and renumbers the equations and the variables. So you, you, you get this strongly connected component. And you get them as um, a blo lower block diagonal form. So you have around the diagonals, you have um, matrices. If you're lucky, they are just a few matrices. And then in here, you have numbers. So you, you get the lower block triangular form to start with. And then, of course, what you have to do is that you then have to solve these um, blocks of equations in there. And these blocks may be quite large for large models. Uh, now, there's something called tearing that you can use to simplify them. It was invented by an electrical engineer called Krohn. And he also called it dicoptics. And there are books. Uh, he published papers around 1950 and 1960. And the idea is that you have a large nonlinear equation. And you can break this up into a sequence of smaller nonlinear equations. And so what you do is that you pick up a number of variables that you call tearing variables. And then you pick up the same number of equations that you call residuals. Uh, and then you end up with something looking like this. Uh, you can then transform the system. So this is a block triangular form. And then in here, you have um, a collection of vari variables. And, and so these are the tearing variables that are sitting here. And here are, the, here are the residual equations. And now if you can solve this equation down here, then you can recursively go, uh, uh, you have a much smaller nonlinear problem to solve. And then you can go up here and list. Uh, so finding the smallest tearing here, it's a very complicated problem. So therefore, people are using intuition. Hilding was using some intuition. And there's a much better intuition now in the Daimola and the Dassault systems. You can also exploit physics. Because by, for example, electrical systems, it's fairly natural what sort of variables you can use. So right now in, in good software, you can either have automatic tearing, you can have manual tearing where you specify yourself, and you can have a mixture of this. And many of the software for for um, simulation here, they change, they depend a lot on that. I should also mention here a little bit about ordinary differential equation and differential algebraic equation. A differential algebraic equation is simply an equation between variables and differentiated variables. Uh, uh, a special case is that when you have an ordinary differential equation in here, and then you have x and y, and then you have an algebraic relation between x and y. And you know, this is perfect if you're going to model connections. You know. Now when you connect the two capacitors, this voltage is the same as this voltage. Mm -hmm. And if you have two mechanical. So it's a very natural way if we are going to use this modeling paradigm 
and if we are going to uh, connect systems. Um, I sh shall tell you about something called index. And uh, this is a linear differential equation. So in here you have a matrix, and this matrix may be singular. For example, if suppose that this was diagonal, and you have once, and then you have a number of zeros in here, then you simply have a, a, a algebraic equation. So uh, uh, I wanted to talk about the index, and I will do this in this simple form. Uh, if you have these two matrices, there's something called a matrix pencil, which is lambda e minus a, and this is called regular if this is regular for all values of lambda. And the nice thing is that a regular matrix pen pencil can be transformed into, the, a, into a normal form that looks like this. So in other words, the, uh, uh, the E can be transformed into identities, and then in here there is something called N. And this is a block diagonal matrix which has Jordan form with zeros in the diagonal. So it's a matrix that has zeros in the diagonal, and then it must ha may have a varying number of blocks with different ones in the super diagonal. And then here's the right-hand side. Now, if you do this transformation, you can write down what the solution to the differential equation looks like. The differential equation can be, then be written like this, where this is the n matrix. And the smallest integer, such that the nth power of m is zero, is called the... the Differenti differentiation index of the order differential equation. And the solution to this equation looks like a regular solution in order differential equation. And then a number of out of derivatives of uh, the sigma in here. So in other words, a differential algebraic equation has the unpleasant property that the solution is going to contain derivatives of the input function. Now, this is not very pleasant, you know, because taking derivatives is very sensitive to many things. And that is the reason why you try to get models where the index is not too high. But index plays a very important role. There are sorts of de definitions of index in the more general cases, but, but I'm not going to go into this. So we thought that um, Daimola was a very good idea. And we were, so to say, looking around. And in 1990, that time we had workstations. There were object-oriented programs. And uh, the industrial people we work with, they were very interested that we should restart this research project. And so I got pretty good research funding uh, for to do object-oriented modeling and simulation. Uh, I had a number of people here that are still showing up in the uh, Modelica community I will talk about later on. Uh, we did some experimentation in Lisp and Key, and then we were using C++. And we defined an object-oriented modeling language and we defined a simulator that we were refining. And there was a lots of refining done on the symbolic manipulation that were done by Batson. They were also working on index reduction for the differential algebraic equation. So we had a research group with a handful of people in Lund doing this. <coughs> and then Elmquist, who had done a tour in industry, he was very interested to go back and start his own company. So he came to Lund in 92, and he started his own company to commercialize his PhD thesis, Daimola, because he, he actually worked for another company to, to develop a SCADA-like system. Uh, I didn't mention one thing about the Simnon. Simnon had a formally defined syntax in Bacchus nor form. So, so, you know, the idea that we define things formula was something that, and we also did this for our design language. We defined them formally, so we know what they were doing. Uh, so when he came there, it was very natural that we started um, uh, discussions. Uh, I was also a reviewer of DLR in Germany for quite a long time. So, so we had good relations with them. And um, uh, Hilding actually hired several of the people from our, my group. And uh, I thought that was actually quite a good idea for the people from Muto University to move out to his group. So his, his program at Dog Brick, for example, moved out there. And uh, one of his first customers was Toyota. And Toyota had about 300 engineers working on Daimola when they did the Prius. And they could cut down significantly on the number of tests they did. So there was a lot of migration of researchers from university to Dynasim. And then, of course, uh, Dynasim was acquired with, uh, uh, by Dassault and is now integrated with Katia. And I think a very nice thing about... Um, and the, uh, they are now also doing synchronous extension to, to Modelica. 
And I think a very nice thing by being acquired by Dassault is now they get strongly connected to the French synchronous community, which I think you know, is the, um, the best people in the world to do this. So, so I, think that was, uh, I think that was very important. I see, I also wrote here Dynas in plus plus. There are two other things happening in here. Uh, I had another very good student with computer science background, and he was working again on an applied problem um, coming from industry, where I had to do modeling and combine modeling with optimization. Uh, he wanted to get a piece of um, the code for Dimola uh, because he wanted to integrate optimization. Then you, need, you really need a piece of code to do this. Well, um, that was not possible because uh, Elmkis was just in the process of negotiating with Dassault Systems. But Orkison, he had done computer science. He knew about compiler-compilers. So we looked at the part of, of Modelica that he needed to do his model, and he only needed a fairly small subset. So I said, why don't you just write a compiler-compiler for the subset you have? And he did this. So he write a wrote a compiler-compiler for, for a small subset of Modelica. He also wrote a little optimization language called Optimica, and he could solve this problem very, very efficiently. And then he uh, was very interested in this. So then he sort of say, uh, elaborate this to, to practically the full, the full Modelica. And uh, uh, there was another company called Modelin that was started by two other of our PhDs, um, who I will also talk a little bit about later, because they were doing very interesting applications. They were doing consulting all three of them, all, all of my PhD students. And then Orkeson joined them and they decided they were actually going to do a, a public domain version of Modelica, that's called J Modelica. That's now being, it's now available so you can download it. Uh, they, they also, they work with also other, you know, uh, commercial licenses, but there is actually a version called J Modelica which you can download. And they are quite interesting collaboration. So that's why I write Dynas in plus plus up there. So now we'll talk about Modelica. Uh, so modeling, at least if you're a control engineer, you have to do modeling over very wide physical domains. So you get in touch with electrical engineering, and mechanical engineering, and chemical engineering. You have to do control and optimization. We have to do, you have to have, do computer science in there. And I think we should do much more computer science than we currently have. You have to care about numerical mathematics. There are software involved and there are many tools required. Clearly, we would like to have efficient toolboxes for design and toolboxes we can trust what they are doing. Uh, so there's a very strong incentive for collaboration. And uh, uh, for, uh, so I spoke a lot to Hilning Elmquist about this. And uh, yeah, uh, what we did, so we had this group in Lund working on this. He had this group working on Dynasim. And we discussed future development and uh, Hilding had money from an Esprit project. I had money from another European project. And what we did is that we organized a meeting in Lund where we collected practically all the groups in Europe who were involved with modeling and simulation. So here's a list of, there were people from INRIA, there were people from Gas de France. Uh, uh, and uh, we were sitting there talking for several days. And then we decided it would be very useful to collect the experience we have about modeling and to try to define a new modeling language uh, called Modelica. Uh, so we got a group to do this. So there was a formation of Modelica language group, and they had a language specification in about a year's time. Uh, we also tried to set up a mechanism so that no company could take this and run with this, and so that it would be an organization that we could influence, that we can go there you know, and try to see, you should really do this, you should change this, you should do that. This has been partially but not entirely successful. I should also mention the people who wrote the, one of the first Modelica papers. Here is Hilling Elmquist, and here's Sven Erik Matson, and here's Martin Otto from DLR. This is called Physical System with Modelica. It's well, the, one of the first papers that was written on that in, in 97. There's also something called Modelica Association, uh, which anybody can join. And, it's an, it's, um, uh, and they own the Modelica language. It's a non-proprietary object-oriented equation-based language for modeling complex system. And then there's an association in here that is helping to organize things. And there's quite a bit of European research projects spent in here. And um, I was discussing here that uh, maybe we should do something 
where the strong groups that are here are involved. And uh, uh, I personally think like this. They have done a very good job with Bondelica, and there's lots of experience, but I do think there's a very good time to sit back and think about the fundamentals. Because now you have you know, a lot of experience about this, and it's a complicated language, and I don't think all things have to be there. And in particular, if you have to describe control systems, you can certainly do something that's much more restricted, where you can have much safer verification. So I'm hoping that we can get something like this going. Um, uh, uh, th there are Modelica conferences around uh, roughly one uh, every 18th month. The last one was in Lund. Uh, that was the 10th one. There are design meetings. There have been 82nd design meetings. There's a Modelica standard library. And there are a number of Modelica software. Um, I think very few of this software can run the Modelica standard library. And of course, that is clearly something that the commercial people have to look for. And here is the, the home, home page for, for the Modelica, if you would like to take a look at it. Give you a little flavor of what it is. So, uh, well, I think one nice thing about this way of modeling is that you can have several different representations of it. And um, you can have both overview and uh, 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 details. So here's a typical graphical representation of a little robot. Here you have a more machine. So in here you have a gearbox, you have some masses, you have some other masses, you have rotational joints. So you, have, you can represent it like this. You can also go down. So you can look at this motor drive. So in here there's a motor drive. And you see a bit of a control system sitting there. You can uh, look at an, you can look at this thing here. That's the mathematical model of this. And you can go down. That's the electrical circuit more circuits, and you can go down to the equations. And I think that's very important, that you really can go all the way down, that you see precisely what's going on. Because so often, you know, a lot of the things are hidden. And um, when things go wrong, it's very nice to be able to dig down like this. Um, there are also Modelica libraries, and we have made a strong effort to make a large number of this publicly available. So there is electric analog, there's electric digital, electric in machines, electromagnetics, mechanics, multi-body control blocks, finite state machines, synchronous, logical functions, and matrices. So there are public libraries like this. And at the Modelica conference, uh, they give a prize to uh, the best open libraries each time. So i just give you a little flavor of some of the libraries that are around. So that gives you components that you can pick th things from. Uh, I wanted to give you a, a couple of examples of what the system would look like. Um, this is vehicle simulation. And uh, uh, that's a fairly mature piece. So it's used quite a lot. It's used for, for example, the Formula One cars. It's also used quite a bit you know, for, for commercial automotive cars. And here is a, uh, to give you a, the flavor of a model in here. So this is a fairly detailed vehicle model. Um, it has about 7,000 components. It has 53,000 variables. Um, there are 2,000 scalars. After reduction, you get about 300 states. So there are about 300 differential equations. The largest nonlinear system, when you have done uh, Tarian's algorithm, when you have done a bit of tearing, you are ending up with nonlinear systems of, of third order blocks that you have to solve. There are lots of linear blocks that you have to solve. And this is running quite, quite fast, you know, on uh, a regular, on the regular machine. This is not the largest system. The largest system I've seen have often to do with uh, static optimization. So they are static models. There you may have up to, uh, up to um, uh, several hundred equations. Here's another example. Uh, it's a large paper mill, and they are trying to do coordinated control of the whole, uh, the whole factory. So there are many sub-factories in here, and they have storage tanks. So there are 25 production units, there are 38 buffer tanks, there are about 250 streams, 250 measurements, and about 2,500 beds. So it's a fairly small model. But the interesting thing is that they are using this uh, in production, and they are using it uh, essentially every week. So what they do, 
is that they, they feed in measurements in here and then they do state estimation and then they write an optimization. So they are doing an optimization schedule for a week and then they do simulation to see that there are no snags in this and then they give out the instructions for the optimizations to the people who are responsible for running the units. So it's not automatic but they are generating proposals for the people who are running the units. And this has been, this is about 10 years old right now. So uh, uh, here is a more recent application. This is a feasibility study that some master students did for, for Siemens. It has to do with startup of uh, combined cycle electrical plants. And what they were concerned about was essentially temp temperature gradient. They wanted to have control strategy that would guarantee not to give too high gradient of this. So in here is a very modest model. There are uh, uh, 28 states, uh, but then they did optimization. So they get nonlinear program with about 20,000 variables. And um, uh, so this is the optimization that prob they solve in relation to this. So I would say that this is a fairly small optimization problem that could easily be handled by master students as a master thesis project. Uh, here's a nice application, and this was done by this company model. And it has to do with climate control in vehicles. You know, it's the, essentially the air conditioning type of things in vehicles. And what they did is that they persuaded all the major car manufacturers and their component suppliers to work together. And what the component suppliers do is that they provide in components and validated modelica models. So they supply a modelic mo dynamic model that's tested in the lab. And then they use a standardized, uh, they have an air conditioning library and everybody's using the same library. So you know, for you know, data and materials and things like this. So if you get better material data, you can feed this into all of them at the same time. And then they send the um, models to the car manufacturers and they plug in this model into simulator and they run you know, the regular standard tracks and they look at what is the climate performance and uh, what is the fuel consumption? And then decide, well, not a very big difference. This component is a little bit cheaper, so we buy this one. Uh, and I think that's quite a nice application of modeling. And I mean, it's carried out into engineering practice. So this is a picture coming from one of the, uh, one of the suppliers. And this was all done by modeling. And uh, uh, when you give away a model, you know, you're also afraid that you may give away IP. So what they are doing here, they're doing computation. And of course, you can crack anything with enough computing power. But I mean, uh, so you, you are giving uh, equations, you're, you're mixing equations, you are doing funny names and things like this. So that's how they are doing. But apparently they were satisfied with this way of doing it. So that was a little bit of what I've done. I gave you an introduction. I spoke about analog computing and block diagram modeling. Then I spoke about equation-based modeling and then I spoke about Modelica. So what kind of things uh, can we do? Well, here's another slide. Uh, this book was published by the National Academy of Engineering in 2020. And uh, uh, I showed this in the very beginning to say that, that there will certainly be growth in simulation and modeling around creation of new engineering structures. So many people in industry are convinced that uh, this is something that can be useful. And I think the air conditioning example is quite a striking one. Also what they are doing you know, with Formula One models. Uh, I think that uh, simulation is not the only thing. You know, simulation is, to me, a way to illustrate behavior. But there's much more if we're going to do engineering system because we would like to go from requirements of a system down to hardware in operation. And what I mean by hardware and operation means that we must also take care of this, that when you drive into the car to get it serviced, and there's something wrong with it, there should also be in the tool chain a way to do the changes that are necessary in a safe way. Uh, so uh, what we need to do is static modeling for optimization and system design. We have to look at integrated process and control design to design the control system in conjunction when you do the, the process. We have to do architecture exploration. We have to do optimization. We have to do model reduction because in control, we, we have to work with, phallus, with, redu, with simplified models. So we must have a way to do this. We would like to do parameter estimation. So when we are fitting, fitting models with experimental data, we need to run optimization to do this. 
And we also have to do safe embedded system. Uh, so we really need a tool chain. And that means that the things have to operate with each other. So uh, for example, in Modelica, you do quite a useful thing when you're reducing the models, you know, to lower block diagonal form into tearing. It would be very nice to be able to take out that representation in a machine readable form so it can be used for other things. So I think what we should really should do is to push the people who are developing this so that we get, you know, intermediate results in a very well-defined form that we should take out. And I think it's possible to some degree to do this. Uh, uh, here's a tool chain. Uh, one tool cannot do, do anything. Uh, so that's more or less what I've said. And we shouldn't forget about the last thing, about reef, reef configuration and upgrading. So when you find something that's wrong, you should be able to trace back through, through the tool chain what you are doing. There are some little efforts done, for example. Uh, uh, there is something called F FMI and FMU that's driven by the automotive industry where they try to do a, uh, it's a functional mock-up interface where you can encapsulate a simulation model so it can, can be run by other pieces. And I think the checking of formalism is done better in the FMI and FMU than is done in Modelica because they are writing pieces of code that you can see this is actually a valid FMU model. I don't know how well the syntax and the semantics of that is defined, but that's probably something that Mark and other people can find out. But I think it's, a, it's an effort to try to do this and it's standardized. Uh, here's another thing that I think is quite important. I mentioned with analog computing that you had this little alarm when voltage went above plus minus 500 volts. I think when we're developing models that we should also give validity regions. We should try to express under, in, under what circumstances is this model valid. And there's a nice book in control written by Jill Pellegrin and De Colm. And Pellegrin was um, uh, chief of Sup Aero. He was also a general in the French Air Force. And they have presented something they call the uncertainty lemon. And here's my representation of the uncertainty lemon. What they say is that the model is valid in certain amplitude ranges and certain frequency ranges. So if you draw a little curve in here, that's the curve where the model is valid. And in Modelica, it would be quite easy to implement this because amplitude, that's just you know, a nonlinear function. And also frequency. We can replace frequency because you have derivatives of all the important variables in Modelica. So this will be a relation between a signal and its derivative. And I think that would be tremendously useful to do. So when we do model, we deliver a validity range of it. And you, you can actually do, say, uh, grades in here if you want to. So when you're running the huge simulator when you're plugging things together, you get alarms when, when, when you tell that this model is not correct. And this is not horribly complicated to do. Uh, I think there are many challenges. Uh, I think Modelic is a good beginning, but I do think it would make a lot of sense today to sit down and take a serious look at it. But people are not involved in the day-to-day -day development of this. Um, and uh, for example, they need improvement, uh, that needs improvement at the language level and at the representation level. And I'm particularly keen on the representation of um, the control system. Because if you allow anybody to write a control system in the full modelica, it's going to be hopeless to show that it's correct. But in order to do a control system, I'm convinced that you don't need the full system. Uh, uh, so there is also a lot of need to uh, improve upon the symbolic and numerical com computations uh, because they are by no means perfect. Uh, I think anything where you can demonstrate that what you do is formally correct is tremendously useful. Even if you cannot take the full program, if you can take pieces and show that they are formally correct, that applies, you know, for example, to control design. So when you do control design and do model, uh, if you can put in uh, some formal methods into this, I think it's useful. I think we need, we need to look at the, the tool chain. I think Modelic Association is a pretty good vehicle because one can actually influence the Modelica developer. You can go to the Modelica design meetings. And uh, even if the people are sitting there may not listen to you first, if you're a bit persistent, you can go there and you can talk and you present things. So I would encourage anybody who is um, interested in this 
and doing something like this, to try to go in there and uh, influence what's happening in the right direction. And I do think we need to have an influx of younger, bright people in it, because it has been more or less the same people who have been doing it so far. So if you're interested, join the effort and influence the development. Then to do this, I think we need an interesting collection of talents. Clearly, if you're doing modeling and simulation, you must know the domain, whether it's physics, engineering, biology, economy. So you must know, you must have this knowledge in there. You must also have the mathematics. You must have computing and you must have control. And com communication is becoming more and more important. And of course, nobody can master all of this. But I think it's possible to educate engineers who are very good in this field and they know enough about these interfaces so that they can intelligently communicate with the other people. And I think that's something we should work very hard on. And in control, we have been very bad, you know. Uh, when, when we started, we made the, made the course about everything we knew. When we knew a little bit more, we made another course, we made another course, we made another course, we made another course. And there have been very few efforts to try to compress the knowledge. Uh, and computer science is younger than we are, so I think there may be similar situations in computer science. But I, I, so what we need to do is that we need to have engineers who know, are very good in here, but they should know enough about these other interfaces in here to communicate. Uh, so I wanted to end by showing a picture of a man who's about my vintage. Uh, it's Solomon Gollum. He has written a beautiful little uh, book, uh, article called Mathematical Models, Uses and Limitations in the Aeronautical Journal. Uh, uh, he's professor of the University of Southern California, and um, uh, he has invented games, uh, and he inspired Tetris, uh, and he had done combinatorial analysis. So it's a solid mathematician. And here is an excerpt from his papers. Don't apply a model until you understand the simplifying assumption on which it's based and can test their applicability. So of course, that's difficult when you deal with large models. But if you start to introduce validity ranges, you are coming a little bit closer to that. This is one I really like. Distinguish at all time between the model and the real world. You will never strike oil by drilling through the map. So for each of these wise words, he also has some of these um, catchy phrases. Here's another one I also like. Don't expect that by having named a demon, you have destroyed him. Like, you know, singularities, you know, high index and things like this. And here's another one which I think is particularly appropriate for teachers. The purpose of notation and terminology should be to enhance insight and facilitate computation, not to impress or confuse the uninitiated. Thank you very much.